for those who have joined. Welcome, everybody. This is the first event of the Innovation Week. Makes me very happy. With me, there is Mike Evers, who is coming from the Mozilla team, talking about prototyping in the midst of rapid transition. If you have any questions, please add them on the chat. If you're watching us on YouTube, please add your questions on the chat on YouTube, and I will make sure to also see that. And without anything more, I'm going to give the floor to Mike. All right. Thank you all for joining and for your support of Mozilla. This event, like most of what we do in Innovation Studio slash Life, is an experiment. So thank you for being a part of it. I'm Mike Evers, a design technologist in Mozilla's Innovation Studio. And I'm going to be talking about prototyping in times of rapid transition, which I imagine for most of you, I know for me, applies to the present moment. Here's what we're going to cover in the session. I'll give you a little context on Mozilla, the Innovation Studio, myself. I'll talk about an app I built, which I used as a vehicle to beta test all kinds of emerging AI technologies and teach myself the AI. And then we'll talk about how I'm trying to work education into my process for innovation. Lastly, I'd love to discuss ways that we can build together. That's what this week is all about. And we're really trying to work closer with the community and, and learn from you and, and help you where you're stuck. We're all in this together. So we want to create responsible AI alternatives to the sort of mass scale platform dominance that we're seeing right now uh, from companies like OpenAI, Google, Microsoft, et cetera. Okay, so my work might most closely be tied to the work that we're doing for AI Guide, but um, you can see a lot of the projects that Innovation Studio is working on here. You'll hear from these folks um, later on in the week about the work that they're doing. I'm a sort of design dev hybrid and I love prototyping. I love interfacing with the tech community and helping people get unstuck. I also like it when tech gets weird. Lucky for me, things are plenty weird today. And Mozilla has been amazingly supportive of letting us in the innovation studio take our explorations in a variety of different directions we're curious about. So you may ask yourself, how did I get here? Less than a year ago, my colleague Thomas Lodato and I were focused on the creator economy. We just exhausted our list of ways we could try to uh, leverage some of the inertia around Web3 and decentralization as a safe mechanism for creator support, but the need for support of independent creators remained. We focused in on independent podcasters as a community to talk with and try to support, and we ended up building this prototype we called Two. This was capable of delivering improved analytics on listener behavior by embedding them into the audio files themselves. Well, around this time, ChatGPT came out and exploded and all the attention shifted to AI. I ended up working on Mozilla's AI guide. I, and in my spare time, we started building an app called PodQuest. And PodQuest allows you to ask ChatGPT style questions about the content of podcast episodes. We also built a prototype called Big Mouth, which was built to explore what it'd be like to talk to ChatGPT and have it talk back versus rely on text. Uh, obviously, eventually, ChatGPT rolled that feature out for themselves. And in the course of all of that, we came to realize that having a functional AI-enabled app without a huge user base allowed us to really quickly iterate and test all of these emerging technologies that were just springing up every day, every week that we were trying to scramble and, and stay on top of. So we learned a ton from that experience, and the prototypes that we built allowed us to get fluent with that technology and roll it into all of the things that we are building here. So before I get into that, let me just show you a quick demo of some of the projects I, I just mentioned so you can get a sense of just the scope and the fidelity of the things that I'm building because they'll they'll be a bit different than what some of the other teams are doing uh, who are working at a slightly higher fidelity. So this is PodQuest. This is what allows you to ask questions about podcasts. It transcribes them gets context on them, and then can answer any question you have about the podcast. So just like ChatGPT, but working with audio. It also allows you to jump to a specific spot in yeah, audio. So, so this story came from a content marketer named Jake Ward. His company had just pulled off an SEO heist that stole 3.6 million in total traffic from a competitor. 
I ask it for something that happened in the podcast. It found the timestamp because it was kind of fluent with, with how transcript formats work, and it jumped me to a specific spot in the audio. This prototype here is Big Mouth, where I'm experimenting with talking to ChatGPT and having it talk back. What is your view on trustworthy AI? Trustworthy AI is crucial. It must adhere to ethical principles and be transparent, accountable, unbiased, and ensure privacy and security. Get some wolves howling again. Okay. So those were explorations with AudioCraft and like the wolves that you heard howling are not actual recordings of wolves. It's it's an AI's attempt to try and reproduce the sound of wolves. The trance music is AI's interpretation of what trance music might sound like. It's not sampled or anything like that. So the other thing we were doing is just making a lot of videos. Like as we worked, as we learned, I was recording videos on my process and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Working documentation and education into our processes is, is a big part of, of what I'm trying to do uh, on the Innovation Studio team. Um, I'm also super passionate about sustainability and really looking at AI's impact there. Uh, I've got some videos on that, but this is a kind of a screenshot of our Firefox Energy Profiler, which is amazing and actually has data on how much carbon impact your browsing behavior has. We also put out Collab Notebooks, or Google Collab, however you like to say it, where you can actually implement and tweak code yourself. The AI Guide also does that stuff, so definitely check that out. And also we work in the open, a lot of the repos are open source. You can take the code. Here's the AI guide and you'll see in a minute their, their collab notebooks. And this is the kind of content that you'll see on AI guide. And so these are some of the things that I've been up to over the past about six months. So with PodQuest, we started with this simple question. With JetGPT at the time, you could ask questions about textual content on the internet, but what if you wanted to ask questions about audio? We had just finished up this podcasting exploration and, and our heads were in the audio space. I encountered all this great content in the podcast I listened to, but I could never go back and find that stuff or take notes the way I could on the web. So we made an interface to grab the audio files for podcasts using the open podcast index and a large language model to transcribe them and answer questions about them. And as we did this, we started to get all these other questions. So for example, could the LLM understand transcript timestamps? Could you jump straight to the spot in an audio file where a podcast was being discussed? Could the LLM ask you questions to test your knowledge? And, and by the way, when I say LLM, I'm, I'm talking about a large language model. That, that is essentially what ChatGPT is, if you're not familiar with that. Okay, so these questions necessitated new technical requirements in order to test and implement things. And we started running into all these barriers, like the very specific syntax of podcast transcript formats and the amount of context a large language model could keep in memory. You know, we were transcribing these hour-long podcasts, so we were passing a lot of context over to the model. Also, just how do you handle the experience when a podcast takes like a minute or two to transcribe? You know, how do you keep the user engaged or inform them about that process? This created a lot of valuable learnings about how to build at scale, as well as uh, knowledge and flexibility into AI applications. We also learned that while AI is great at answering your questions, it's not always great at asking them. For example, there's a known problem where a large language model loves to pick questions from the beginning and end of the content you give it, because in documents like research papers and literature on the internet, that's often where the most important stuff is, the beginning and the end. But in a podcast, that's where all the advertisements and show notes and, and credits come in. So it was actually quite a bit of a challenge to, to extract content from the middle, from the heart of, of these podcasts. So to solve these problems, we learned some really valuable techniques. AI-specific things like function calling, retrieval augmented generation, or RAG, quantization, but also ML ops stuff like job queues, caching, and workers, things to just make everything run a little more smoothly. 
We learned about better ways to talk to the LLM through emerging techniques for prompt engineering, things with rad names like Rag Fusion and Radit. And we're obviously still learning a ton and the space is developing quickly. So meanwhile, ChatGPT is an instant hit, but one thing I hadn't seen at the time was the ability to speak to ChatGPT or hear it speak back. And so using some Microsoft technologies, actually, I created a prototype called Big Mouth, which you saw, to see what the experience of not having to type and read might feel like when you're interacting with an LLM. Obviously, as I mentioned, ChatGPT has this feature now, as do several other large language models. But this, in the, in the meantime, created all these follow-up questions. When you're speaking, instead of typing, you have to start dealing with things like accents, background noise, different languages. Do people feel comfortable talking out loud to their computer and hearing it talk back? And if so, under what conditions? As we've seen with even ChatGPT and other large language models, they still struggle with different languages. So while English might work smoothly, when it comes to lesser used languages, they can, they can really fail. So once we brought audio into the mix, we started to wonder whether we could use AI to generate sounds or music. We were able to throw all this stuff into the framework we created for podcast in order to quickly evaluate and test those theories. So you might be able to spin up a prototype like AudioCraft in a day. But as I've mentioned, the, the problem as we started working was that as soon as we build a low-level prototype for these add-on features, companies like OpenAI would release a full-blown polished version of this stuff that would include that functionality into their platform. No doubt they'd been working on the same challenges for some time, and you just couldn't move fast enough. So that raised the question for us, how do we create something that's unique and ownable so we're not constantly battling the speed and dominance of big tech? Um, and that's a huge question. Uh, it was clear we needed to be working at a much lower level of AI, training and fine-tuning our own models, which meant a lot more learning for me. So. That's where I'm at right now. Uh, if we need to train a model, we need a fair bit of data. Right now, I'm looking into autonomous AI agents who, given a stated goal, can go determine their own steps to take to solve a problem. Can I make a scraper to use on my own website to generate fine-tuning data? I've actually got a, a video that's coming out on YouTube around that. By the way, hold up. Is this ethical? Is this the future we want? What is the environmental cost of all of this? How does it affect jobs? Who else is worried about this stuff? Hopefully lots of people, it's clear to us that in order to thrive as a mission-driven user-centric company and not get bowled over by big tech, we need to work in community with others like you all. So that brings us to working in the open and sharing knowledge. Um, but I'll pause for a second here and just see if anybody's got any questions about what I just blasted through. <laughs> I think we're good for now. Okay. Building a community means education and engagement, and that's a whole different way of working than just being in your own silo and cranking on code all day. So in terms of sharing my learnings with others, the first thing I realized was if I wanted to explain to others how I do something, I needed to start taking meticulous notes so that other people could reproduce the same steps that I was taking. I'm also learning that if you're gonna share code as part of an instructional process, you can't just drop the whole finished code base on someone, it's too daunting, and it misses all the context of why you work the way you work, how to add increasing levels of fidelity or complexity to a, a solution. And so what I learned to do was create these code checkpoints, but that meant I had to create a plan for what and how much to commit. I had to maintain branches for each checkpoint of a, a tutorial that I was building and commit code with a lot of intention and clarity. Because I'm making tutorial videos, I also have to be really deliberate in the way I work down to even the keystrokes I take. Your work is under a lot of scrutiny when you're documenting in real time. So I found one trick, which we'll see in this animated GIF here, is, is to work backwards. You create a working section of code, and then you delete it in reverse logical steps until you have a starting point, and then you record forward undoing your keystrokes until you've got your finished example. Of course, working in the open on social media means you're gonna get a healthy dose of people's minds. I found this, while sometimes hard, to be a really helpful thing, actually, and much better than no feedback at all. So this is like some actual feedback that I, I see on, on videos that I put out. But that feedback helps me cover my blind spots. It lets me know what are still unsolved problems for people. It gives me an idea of what they care about who my audience is and isn't, and where people get confused. 
it gives me a clear direction of, about where my work should head. Uh, as I mentioned, tech changes fast. Because of this, I often hear why a solution I built is not as good as something else people use that I might not even be aware of. From this, I can learn what I'm up against, what my solution's missing, what people care the most about, and how I might be using those tools myself more effectively. So this is a discussion from LlamaFile, and people are discussing alternatives to LlamaFile. My chosen format for documentation is, for the most part, videos on YouTube, but video editing can take up a ton of time if you let it. If my sole job was to be an influencer or something on YouTube, that might be worth it. But right now, my main goal is just to build things, not, not build an audience. So that means I had to get pretty fast at documenting my work, and that meant getting good with documentation tools and not overcomplicating things. I often need to design collateral in lots of different formats to put on other channels of social media and blog posts, et cetera. I found that by starting with video, I can turn this into all of those derivatives with the help of AI and other modern tools. Turn transcripts into text, turn segments of video into animated GIFs and thumbnails, et cetera. Getting fast also involves valuing people's time, including your own. Attention spans are short. I found in video, I have maybe 45 seconds in the video to get to the point about what we're going to accomplish and hook people on what I'm trying to educate them on. I'm also looking to improve on distilling concepts to their essential components and cutting out the fluff. That includes presenting. So thank you for bearing with me as I uh, learn to be a better presenter. Each time I iterate on the process of working in the open, I learn something new. As our head of innovation likes to say, progress, not perfection. I'm often surprised at who responds to the content we put out. Sometimes it's the tech savvy AI enthusiasts you might expect. But sometimes it's artists or kids or business people or researchers, nonprofit workers. There's so many benefits to working in the open. The founding editor of Wired, Kevin Kelly, wrote this essay in 2008 called A Thousand True Fans. And the idea behind it was that you don't need the whole internet. You just need a thousand people who would pay you a hundred bucks a year to support your work. And I can totally relate to this, even without the money. Uh, the right people will help make your life infinitely easier. They'll help sustain you and amplify your work. You'll help them in turn, and that'll make your job feel worth doing and working in the open. Help that come true for me. So what I really want to figure out with our growing community is how we can all build together, specifically to uphold the values and opportunities that other organizations are too profit motivated or moving too fast to honing on. So. There are a ton of ways to participate with Mozilla, and we're really growing this muscle, and we're rolling out a lot of things over the coming months, which you'll hear about through the course of Innovation Week. There's the AI guide that I mentioned. So there's obviously this Discord. There will be a lot more activity on those channels in the coming months. I think we're just about to roll out a new sort of installment on the AI guide. Mozilla Connect, if y'all haven't heard of it, is a sort of a community forum where you can surface ideas for things you'd like to see us work on or, or see exist out on the internet for things of a more technical nature. We have Bugzilla, which is a longstanding platform where people can report issues with our products and even help fix them. And of course, because we are open source, there's the option to just file issues in GitHub. We're also in the private beta stages of Mozilla.social, a Mastodon instance, as well as our website and blog for innovation, future.mozilla.org. So we can maybe post some of these links in the channel as well, but that'll be seeing a lot of changes in the coming months as well. Um, and then there's Miko, which is our innovation grants program that funds and fosters innovators like you all. And there's some really cool stuff happening there. So please stay in touch with us, uh, give us your thoughts, follow our projects. And if you're working on interesting projects yourself, we definitely want to hear from you. Thanks for tuning into this talk and for your support of Mozilla. We hope that you tune in for other events the rest of this week, which I, I imagine we'll announce here after I shut up. Thank you very much. And I see Brittany coming on stage. Great show.
So one huge thank you, Mike, for presenting and sharing some of your explorations. The other piece you were hinting at the AI guide. And one of the things I want to make sure that everybody knows is I, I know people were asking to contribute to the guide. We've made it a lot easier to contribute. When you open up the new version of the guide, you'll see contribute buttons aligned to different topics. And again, just looking at how to create a platform so that really interesting, impactful, open source related AI work gets elevated and can be used to help other people learn. So we'll drop a link. I think we shared one earlier, but you can go in and add some of your projects so they can be some of the stuff that you're prototyping. Hey, I figured out a way to get X and Y accomplished. Here's a tool that I built. Feel free to submit a range of products to the guide. I think we'll also open the floor if there are any questions and see a lot of claps and comments. Uh, Mike, for your presentation. So if there anybody has any questions about what Mike just presented, now is the time to talk. I either really confused people or, or just nailed it, solved, <laughs> solved all the problems. I think you nailed it. Um, <laughs> I just posted the blog that also shows how to contribute projects as well. There we go. If you spoke about working in the open, are there particular talents that you are interested in inviting people to collaborate with? Oh man, so many. I know I have mine and I won't speak for, for all of Innovation Studio or Mozilla, but yeah, multimodal is a huge interest to me. And what that unlocks or inhibits in terms of accessibility and equity, the sustainability implications of AI and what happens when we're all talking with a large language model instead of just doing Google searches, how do we make those processes more efficient and trustworthy? If, if you tuned into Simon Willison's talk on LLM attacks, there's all kinds of ways, just as there have always been to subvert the technologies that we have on the internet and with AI that brings all sorts of new problems that we have to tackle. So that's a big focus area for me as well. We have another one. Is most of the focus on model creation on LLM type effort? Definitely in my world. And also I do some audio and, and video specific stuff. So more computer vision type AI, but yeah, large language models is my focus right now, just because that's the primary interaction surface for people. If we were to develop platforms that were more user facing, I would probably be less focused there and, and more focused on whatever the needs of those platforms were. But right now, this is a good way to kind of create user interaction. It's, it's come around so quickly. And while I had been doing some machine learning related stuff, I don't know, four years ago, just kind of dabbling when GANs came out and, and all this deep dream stuff came around, my interest there was just like the weirdness of AI. And, you know, now it is just very much a part of how we interact with the internet. And I've just had to get up to speed on all kinds of new technologies very quickly, as I'm sure a lot of people here are having to do. We're all in it together. It's as confusing to me as it uh, probably is to somebody who doesn't work in tech. And that's why we need to work in the open. We need to uh, be open to learning from, from others who are making advancements and are on the same page as, as Mozilla about creating AI that's trustworthy and responsible and transparent and all of those things that we, we have championed for 25 or some odd years. I have to say, it's uh, music to my ears when we hear say working in the open. Why did you choose a LLM for transcription? Don't we have a smaller ML solutions, whisper, deep speech, et cetera, for just the transcription part? Yeah, the, the transcription actually was using Whisper, so that's that's what I'm using. And actually, I, I think it's, you know, most of my demos were from an older version of Whisper. It's gotten quite a bit faster. And there's also some alternatives to Whisper now, which I'd, I'd love to look up because while Whisper is an open source library, it is what powers ChatGPT. And, and so I'm always interested in looking at alternatives to ChatGPT and OpenAI. Uh, if folks have recommendations there, I am familiar with deep, deep speech. And I, when I mentioned working with AI, you know, three, four years ago, that's actually what I was working with. And I think I might have some videos on deep speech somewhere out there. But yeah, transcription is from processing intensity perspective. It's kind of in the upper 
middle quadrant in terms of how much compute it takes to to transcribe things. Image generation is obviously vastly higher, but transcription is is no small task. So when I started building PodQuest, for example, I was always transcribing the episodes, no matter what somebody put into the the chat box. But I quickly learned I need to start caching this stuff. I need to save this to a database somewhere so that I'm not constantly getting hit with open AI API credits for transcribing these episodes. Somebody suggesting ICO. And we have another question. Mm. When you said longer context was a problem, did you try any kind of iterative process like daisy chaining first, portion response, summarize it, send it to send it as context, the second one, and so on and so on? Yeah, yeah, kind of by necessity, because every time I added some new way to deal with context window, I would run into new barriers, like especially as I sort of searched more broadly for podcasts and the length of those podcasts increased. I started with just like a two minute podcast that I put up on RSS so that it wouldn't take long to transcribe and it wouldn't be a big dent on my API credits. But yeah, I obviously expanded that to make sure that it would work more widely with other podcasts out there on the internet. And so what I eventually had to do is, you know, because you're working with audio, I had to break that audio up into chunks. So you could get with Whisper, they have like a 20 megabyte limit, I, I think. And that might be like 10 minutes of audio. And so I, I would have to break that audio down into chunks, transcribe those chunks, keep track of the order in which they, they were sort of chunked out because I was transcribing them and, and essentially reassemble the transcript so that you could ask questions of it in the large language model. And I might have mentioned something called RAG. If you don't know what that is, retrieval augmented generation. That's essentially passing that transcript as a sort of embedding into a vector database that the large language model can query instead of you know having the need to fine tune the model. But as I mentioned, uh, fine tuning is very much on my radar. Um, I'm very curious to see what uh, we might learn by uh, having a model that's super familiar with not just language in general, but the structure of the language that's commonly presented in podcasts. I expect it to get a lot better at asking questions of the user when it understands that, you know, the important stuff in a podcast is not necessarily at the beginning and the end. It's, it's kind of more in the middle and the heart of things. And you talk about interest in multimodal LLM as well. Is the interest more towards the capacity portions of it or the trustworthy net safety guard? Both super uh, important. While I might be interested in the capability, you can't push that stuff forward if it's not trustworthy. If there aren't guardrails, they won't see the light of day. Not from us anyway, you know, maybe from other other companies, but maybe maybe Grok. So you can't have one without the other, but my skill set is more in, in testing the capability of these things. And when it comes to privacy and security, yeah, you really need a deep knowledge there. And, and we do have those folks on our team who are you know constantly thinking about privacy and security and, and who are very much looking into that stuff, as well as the Mozilla Foundation uh, is doing a lot of work there. And we have two more questions. I like that people are starting talking. Are you trying exploring topic-wise fine-tuning for any of these problems? In that case, any idea actually training smaller, similar to what you were saying about training on your own data? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's that might be an interesting question for the entire room, and I'd be curious to see what, what other people are doing. I could put in a plug for something that we're building, which is not multimodal at this time, but uh, as far as I know, but um, it's called memory cache, which is designed to work locally on your own data. And you'll hear about that later in the week. Um, but yeah, I don't know. What are, what are people using? Any tips on how I can create my own mid-turn API images, ideally on my own machine, MacBook Pro or free collab account? Oh, I'm sorry. That, that was the one I was responding to. Are you trying to explore topic-wise fine-tuning? Yes. So that is kind of like the next step for me. And when I mentioned these autonomous agents, I'm thinking about that in two ways. One is if I'm going to fine-tune, I need data. You know, we're not necessarily always in that in the habit of collecting data here at Mozilla. We really try to um, collect only what we need for your privacy and security. So that's like a, a new 
a new thing for us. And obviously for AI, data is crucial. So I'm interested in automating that process, perhaps even on my own website to generate these transcripts that I can fine tune on to, to see sort of what that unlocks in terms of the experience on something like PodQuest. But I'm also interested in it because I've been hearing about like these, I was listening to Hard Fork, which is this amazing uh, podcast that you heard a little snippet of earlier. They were talking about these SEO heists. I'm not sure if, if folks heard about that, but there was a social media company who was sort of bragging about how they use these autonomous agents to go out and scrape a competitor's website and steal a bunch of traffic from that site by building a carbon copy of that site with better SEO. And so I'm thinking about it from a potential attack surface where, you know, what is a future like where the internet is full of these agents that are executing commands according to their own judgment or training uh, on your behalf? Uh, we also got a question about uh, any way to collaborate. Um, a web page place for a list of topics most of the interested in, and uh, Brittany has uh, already uh, added the AI guide uh, link. So if you're interested on about how to collaborate, the uh, guide link is there. Also, if you have any questions about the AI guide, there is a Discord channel about AI guide. So if you cannot find the things that you want on the web page, it's why we have Discord and the ability for people to ask your questions. Yeah, and I'll also put in a plug for Mozilla Connect there. It's not AI specific, but it's a great place to go to see the ideas that people are are coming up with for problems that we could be working on. And we have a great community manager there who floats those questions to the right people at Mozilla to tackle them. So I often get pinged by him around things like sustainability. So Mozilla Connect is an outlet as well. Good question. I see one on on fine tuning on local data. Definitely check out Llama File. I put out a video on how to get started with Llama File. If you need it, it's on my YouTube channel and I can post a link to that at some point. That's a, a project that we just rolled out to be able to fine tune and run a model on, on your local data. Llama File allows you to interact with a, a large language model. I don't think it allows you to fine tune, but memory cache is the R project that's in progress that will allow you to actually, you know, train on your own data. We don't have any other questions. So with that, I'm gonna close this meeting. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you everyone for, for adding your questions. There's gonna be again, a live event coming on Wednesday about Solon and I'll see you all there. Bye everyone. Bye.